Okay, so welcome to Retech, and today we're going to talk about the Manchester Baby. It was a machine developed by Tom Kilburn and also Jeff Toothill, and basically it wasn't really a production machine. It was a machine that was designed to prove a concept, to be a bit of an experiment, and to prove that we could design these kind of computers, but it was also a machine to test the Williams tube. And the Williams tube was basically a storage device, me early memory. And it was a big success. The machine was intended to be a practical computer, a computer designed as a test bed. And really, even by the standards of the time, it wasn't a particularly powerful machine. Um, it wasn't groundbreaking, but it was designed to work and to be functioning and really to kind of test the Williams tube and that's what it did. It did that incredibly well. The Manchester Baby wasn't powerful as we said, it had a 32-bit word length and it was one kibby bit in memory size and that is a, an infinitely tiny amount of memory when you compare it to modern machines. But again, memory was expensive at the time and memory was very hard to do and to produce. We're talking 1948 here. This is literally only three years after the um, end of the Second World War. So, you know, there wasn't a massive gap between exiting the war and also developing these kind of computers. Charles Babbage in the 1930s did a design for a controlled program or a program controlled computer system and that was in the 1930s and it took from the 1930s a century before Alan Turing got involved and he published his description of what became known as the Turing machine. It was a theoretical concept basically intended to explore the limits of what computers and computer science could do but this wasn't a physical machine, it was all theoretical. So we, we've moved on 100 years to that point. In May 1941, Conrad Zeus produced the Z3 and it was the world's first working, programmable, fully automatic computer. And it was a binary digital logic system and it was working at function but it wasn't really what people would now accept as Turing complete because it lacked kind of conditional branching which was part of the kind of thesis and the concept of Alan Turing's machine but it was a step in the right direction and the Z3 stored all of its programming on magnetic tape but it wasn't really um, a fully digital or fully electronic machine as they became later down the, the line and it wasn't until a little later that the Colossus of 1943 became the first electronic computing device but it wasn't a general purpose machine so we're kind of heading a little bit more, more towards Turing completeness as his theory goes but we weren't there yet. Now ENIAC 1945 to 46 I mean it was kind of stepping stones we weren't that far away on each incremental update. So it was the first machine to be electronic and also be general purpose. It was Turing complete with conditional branching and it was also programmable to solve a wide variety of problems or a wide variety of subsets and it was almost a general computer. But its program was held in a state of switches and patch cords, so it wasn't really 100% Turing complete. It didn't have its internal memory in the way that the later machines kind of were developing. And that was a big problem because it would take hours and hours and hours to program this machine with switches and patch cords. And it was around this time that Turing and Zeus were investigating the use of a stored program method where it didn't need switches and patch cords and basically it was closer to what Turing envisaged but it was still a little way off at this point and the ENIAC of 1948 was another step closer. 
we took another step closer to our kind of concept of modern computers with the von Neumann computer and that was a system that used a stored memory system and that came out of radar research in the Second World War and it also came out of where Tom Kilbone was being involved so it, everything seems to be tying together again you know you've got Turing and Kilburn von Neumann computer and you've got other people all involved around the same time aiming for the same goal so it was kind of a rapid development era that you know we don't kind of see in the same way today because all of these people were coming at the computer idea or the computing idea from very different angles things moved on a bit and um, basically Turing joined the National Physics Laboratory in October 1945 and basically he was working with scientists from the Ministry of Supply they concluded that Britain needed a national mathematical laboratory to coordinate machine aided computations now this was a huge step again government led but with private individuals running the show such as Turing and his colleagues. This was set up in 1946 and Alan Turing presented a paper outlining his design for an electronic stored program computer and that was really initially to be known as the ACE, the Automatic Computing Engine and it was one of the first of several projects set up in the following years in the Second World War with the aim of constructing a stored program computer so things are kind of stalled a little bit because you could have switches and patch cords and you could make the machines work such as the ENIAC on this system but getting a system where it was stored and it literally had to be input by whatever means into the computer because at the time they weren't sure of whatever means really meant was a huge step and they did try mercury delay lines for the A but it was not really that successful and the telecoms research establishment was also approached for assistance on this and it was Maurice Wilkes at the University of Cambridge the mathematical laboratory which eventually came up with the system of using mercury delay lines and that became the EDZAC and the EDZAC became the Lions computer which was one of the very first commercially available computers now EDZAC went a stage further than ENIAC because it was a stored computer system using mercury delay lines now if you want a little bit more of Morris Wilkes just have a look at my history of computers with Morris Wilkes. It's a fascinating look into how computers developed. Now, although early computers such as EDZAC use very successful means of using the mercury delay line, um, the technology had a lot of drawbacks and it was heavy, large, expensive, and it did not allow data to be randomly accessed. It was refreshed. It was literally going around, if you envisage the easiest way to explain, a, a loop. So it was being refreshed and refreshed and it was going back and back every single time until it was required. So it was a refreshed form of data, but it was very cumbersome and very expensive. And Mercury not really the best substance in the world to use for anything to be honest so it did have its drawbacks mercury delay lines were kind of acoustic very similar to sonar and they had to be temperature controlled the the actual sound waves had to be perfect and you know it was very very time consuming but it worked in the case of EDZAC and EDZAC became a very influential machine because it was programmable from a stored program perspective. Now this time Williams had seen the experiment and seen what you could do with mercury delay lines but he was kind of thinking of a way that radar worked and it was a way that of using CRTs and it could be refreshable and he joined up with um, Tom Kilburn who was a radar engineer at the time he worked on various installations and they 
kind of came up with an electronic form of memory known as the Williams tube or the Williams Kilburn tube and it was based on a standard CRT and it was the first random access memory that was ever produced. Now EDSAC wasn't random access so this was another huge step in the kind of leap towards where we are now and it was a huge influence on what computers could do and what they could possibly do in the future so it was a massive step. Now the CRT worked in a binary state and it was based on the charge okay so at the end of the day you could have a high and a low charge which equated to a one or a zero and that's the way everything in the history of computers right through to the modern day works it's ones and zeros on and off so it was a very early form of random access memory and it used the same principles as we use today so it was a massive step but again it was cumbersome it was bulky and on each progressive step things got smaller and more reliable but yeah that's how it works today as well the the tube being a low and a high state on its basically output um, was basically a dot or a dash on the screen and you know most people think Morse code but again it's how to differentiate between a one and a zero the the charge was kind of very rapid it dissipated in about 0 0.2 seconds but it could be refreshed and it could be picked up by the detector again so again it was refreshable um, it had to be fairly quickly refreshed because 0.2 of a second is you know in terms of the computers around in the day a massively quick form of data so you didn't have a lot of time to refresh the signal otherwise it would just dissipate and this Williams Kilburn tube went on to be used in the Manchester baby there's a quote I like to read to you and this comes from Williams and Kilburn at the time and they basically said let's be clear before we go any further neither Tom Kilburn nor I knew the first thing about computers when we arrived at Manchester University Newman explained the whole business of how computers worked were new to us so it was not a definite that these machines were ever going to work anyway and because so few people had experience with computers they picked either mathematicians scientists radar engineers and so on to kind of try and work this out and get something moving so it was for a lot of it stabbing in the dark coming up with theories and ideas and seeing how they would pan out and another quote from Kilburn was Kilburn had a hard time recalling the influences on his own machine's design um, in that period somehow I knew what a digital computer was but where I got this knowledge from I had no idea basically on the fly which is fantastic when you think of it. you can kind of think about how machines and computers and electronic goods are kind of developed today it's not really on the fly we have a massive background of 50 plus years of experience to kind of go back to and reference to to form our ideas now but could you try to imagine inventing something that hadn't been invented before um, that's an incredibly difficult thing to kind of conceptualize or to deal with for most people by June of 1948 the the Manchester baby had been built and it was working and it was massive when you think about the size of computers today such as your mobile phone which is essentially a computer it was 17 feet or 5.2 meters in length and 7 feet 4 inches or 2.25 meters or 2.24 meters tall and it weighed about one ton and the machine contained 550 valves and 300 diodes and it had a power consumption of 3500 watts which was you know if you said you were going to get an appliance today that consumed 3500 watts you would kind of balk at the idea and go no I'm not having that anywhere near my property or my building or my office or my home and this is not even encroaching the huge wattage that some of the even bigger machines that came after it used 
and it used one Williams tube to provide now 32 bit words. Um, everybody thinks of 32 bit computing and so on. Well, it wasn't quite that, but this was a 32 bit word and it used random access memory because remember that this system could use random access because it was based on a CRT model. And it also had a second arithmetic unit which could hold 32 bit accumulator, which that's where the intermediate results of the calculations could be stored temporarily. And, you know, again, everything that was put into this machine came virtually clean sheet. So you've got to give it to these guys for actually just sitting down with a piece of paper and coming up with a working computer. Now, the one big thing about this machine, you know, the 32-bit RAM um, or the 32-bit word of RAM could be either a program instruction or data. So it's moving into the realms of modern computing. Now the computer itself used a, a system where there was, if you generated a word in the computer's memory, it could be read, written or refreshed. Modern really, when you think about um, EDVAC previously, which was patch leads and switches and it kind of was refreshed or written in about 360 microseconds and today you think whoa that's a lifetime but at the time it was rapid but instructions to work um, took about four times longer than that so again it wasn't the fastest thing out of the blocks, but it wasn't meant to be. It was meant to be a proof of concept and also as a proof for the Williams tube as well. Really, it was a success in that front. I mean, it was never commercially available and it was used as a design influencing machine or a test bed. But, you know, later this machine did become a viable machine and commercial machines were based on this machine and this design. The first program for this machine ran on June in 1948 and Tom Kilburn was the, the programmer for this machine and it was kind of entered in a binary form by stepping through each word of the memory in turn and that was consisting of roughly 17 instructions for the first program run on this machine and it was kind of successful because it could do 3.5 million operations in 52 minutes. Now, again, today's computers, blink of an eye, you know, not even that. And basically this thing took 52 minutes to do 3.5 million instructions. That's minutes, not seconds, or tenths of seconds, or hundreds of seconds, or thousands of seconds. And we can see where we've actually moved on in forms of um, speed, power, computability, technology. But we had to start from somewhere and this is where this machine started from. It started from a clean sheet. The Manchester Baby was a precursor to the Mark I, the Manchester Mark I, which did become a successful computer. And it did become a computer that was built or replicated and it wasn't a single unit so it was highly successful from that point of view and one of the biggest reasons for that point of view you can remember that this uh, Manchester Mark I was started to be worked on in 1948 was that it became the Ferranti Mark I and that was a commercially available machine and it sold in quite big numbers for the time and we're heading towards computers now starting to creep into the psyche of people around the world and also creep into the psyche of businesses and companies and institutions and that's where we kind of started stepping to to them becoming commercially available and as these things kind of developed the Manchester Mark I became the Ferrante Mark I which became the world's first commercially available computer. And it didn't end there because in 1998, the Manchester Baby was rebuilt. It was rebuilt from working plans, from memory in some cases, and it was recreated and it's a functioning computer again. And it's available to be viewed 
and inspected and looked at at the Manchester Science Museum. And it's one of those machines that if you're kind of in the area and you're a little bit of a history buff on these things, go and have a look and see how massive even the Manchester baby is in comparison to our modern equipment. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed this. Um, it's a, a step through through to around about 1948 of the influential developments of computers leading up to the Ferranti Mark I. And it stepped through the times of the Manchester baby. So I hope you find this interesting. And if you're into computer history, please subscribe. So thanks for watching and I'll see you again soon.